this. Good morning. Uh, we will keep studying uh, what a metaphor is, and uh, we will keep reading the essay on metaphors. Uh, as we discussed, as we uh, talked about the metaphor last time, if the metaphor is in the wrong hand, it becomes a weapon. Right? So, in a sense, it is very dangerous, as Milan Kundera says. Also, uh, Aristotle says what? A good poet is what? A good poet is very good at using metaphor. So, what is a metaphor? Simply, it is a kind of a comparison, comparison, and you have to find uh, something that is similar between things that are different, right? Uh, we, we will keep uh, reading the essay, Metaphors as a Poetic Process, uh, as shown by, uh, in, a, in a poem by Ye Chini and others. And we are going to read a uh, poem, Metaphors of a uh, Magnifico, a variational summer day. These two poems were by Wallace Stevens, and uh, the other two poems uh, wisdom and the skunk. Uh, these poems are by Shimasini. And uh, also, we are going to read uh, part of a poem by William Shakespeare. Uh, the poem is uh, Phoenix in Total. And those poems are discussed in the essay. So we will keep reading the essay, the latter part of the essay. Okay. Last time we finished uh, part of it. So we'll begin uh, reading the essay from page uh, 15, okay? Okay, section five. Now let me attempt an anatomy atten uh, uh, of metal itself. Is it an esoteric, literary device which is beyond ordinary people? Even some poets seem to have a prejudice against it and see there's a linguistic rose that graces dull speech, right? Metaphor is a linguistic rose that graces dull speech. No, it is uh, essential in a poem. The function of metaphor is more than the floral ornament. The metaphor is created and understood through the mental activities of man, and so to dissect metaphor is to understand imagination. Metaphor is one of the most effective means of conveying the meaning and image of a speaker, probably the best poet in the English language is William Shakespeare, and he is the one who uses metaphors most effectively and imaginatively. And as time goes on, new poets use metaphors in a new way. There are two extreme views of metaphor in philosophical circles too the constructivist and the non-constructivist positions are opposed to each other. The constructivists are the ones that think metaphor plays an important role in both language and thought, and who also tend to undermine the distinction between the metaphorical and the literal. But the non-constructivists treat metaphors as unimportant, deviant, parasitic, or normal uses, and think that metaphors are vague, inessential frills, in, uh, appropriate for the purpose of politician poet, but not for those of scientists, because the goal of science is to furnish an accurate, literal description of a physical reality. Uh, what do you think? Uh, do you agree with the uh, non-constructivists? I think most of the people agree with non-constructivists, right? So metaphor is uh, wrong, metaphor is wrong, right? You, you must not use it, lawyers and scientists. The construct uh, constructivist views is almost the same as the literary people's, though in the back of some literary critic's mind, there is some doubt as to the usefulness of metaphor. Is it because we live uh, in an age of science, we may then learn from Yeats, a lesson, how to invent metaphors that fit today. 
In the meantime, we now have to understand metaphors systematically, uh, systematically in order to uh, make an analysis of poem. I make an analysis of Wallace Stevens' poem and try a new definition of metaphor, or what may be called a metaphoric construct uh, in his poem, metaphors of a ma magnifico. Most of us can understand metaphoric expressions instantly if we are with the same cultural background. We can even understand the poem from a different culture because Literature deals with the common humanistic interests shared by all men. Metaphors as defined by Searle. Uh, a recent analysis of metaphor by John R. Searle is helpful. It classified the thought process of metaphor. Metaphor comprehension has eight principles. Principle one, things that are P are by, de by definition R. Things that are P are by definition R. Here, R is one of the salient defining characteristics of P, for example. Sam is a giant. Sam is a giant. What does it mean? Sam is big because giant is big, right? Uh, it means that Sam is big because giants are by definition big. Okay, principle two. Things that are P are contingently P. Again, the property all is a salient or a well-known property of P things, for example. Sam is a P. Uh, it means that Sam is filthy, gluttonous, and so on. Okay, principle three. Thing, things that are P are often said or believed to be all, though all is false of P, for example. Richard is gorilla. This is false, right? Richard is not a gorilla, but Richard is gorilla. It means that Richard is mean, nasty, prone to violence, and so on. Though gorillas, goril gorillas are in fact shy, sensitive creatures. Okay, principle four. Things that are P are not all, nor are they like all things, nor are they believed to be all. For example, Sally is a block of ice. Sally is a block of ice. Sally is not a nice, actually, right? It means that Sally is unemotional, as cold as ice, right? Because we perceive a connection between Sally and ice. Okay, principle five. P things are not like all things and are not believed to be like all things. Nonetheless, the condition of being P is like the condition of being all, for example. You have become an aristocrat. You have become an aristocrat. It means that since you have just received the huge promotion, your new status is like that of being an aristocrat. Uh, principle six, here P and R are the same or similar meaning, but one, usually P, is restricted in its application and does not literally apply, uh, literally apply to S, for example. His brain is adult. His brain is that it means that he is confused. Adult is only said literally over X, but we say it metaphorically. If his brain is adult, he's dead, right? <laughs> literally, right? But principle seven, uh, relational metaphors. Metaphors involving verbs and predicate adjectives. This is not a separate principle, but a way of applying principles one through six to simple cases, which are not of the uh, uh, form S is P, but relational metaphors, for example. Sam devours books. What? <laughs> is it bookworm? Is it bookworm? <laughs> Sam devours books. But we can understand it, right? It means that he reads books greedily. Right. Uh, he is bookworm, right? The hero finds a relation between P and R. Principle eight, metonymy and synecdoche are special cases of metaphor when one said S is P and means that S is R. P and R may be associated by such relations as the pothole relations, for example, refer to the executive branch of the US government as the White House through principles of association, White House, Blue House, right? Okay, irony. Uh, it is interesting to see Searle close his discussion of metaphor by a brief 
explanational metaphor, irony, and indirect speech act. He explains irony as follows. Suppose you have, we have just broken a priceless uh, Kangxi vase. And I say ironically, that is a brilliant thing to do, right? It's a terrible thing to do, but uh, you can say, that's a brilliant thing to do. Here, as a metaphor, the speaker's meaning and sentence are different, since it, the utterance, is grossly inappropriate. The hearer is compelled to reinterpret it in such a way as to render it appropriate. And the most natural way to interpret it is as meaning the opposite of its literal meaning, ir irony, ironical, right? And about an indirect speech act, he says, suppose that in the usual dinner table situation, I say to you, can you pass the salt? In this situation, you will normally take that as meaning, please pass the salt. The speaker means what he says. However, in addition, he means something more. He, the hearer, is able to infer that the question about his ability is likely to be a polite request to perform the act. Okay? Metaphors, more poetic and new. Mixed metaphor. When a metaphor is formed by comparing two illogical and opposite sources, it is a mixed metaphor, summer. Uh, this is similar to Sars principle four. Two side example from Shakespeare, Hamlet, the Hamlet, uh, the, the prince, uh, the prince, uh, Denmark, right? Uh, Hamlet ponders whether it is nobler to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune or take arms against the sea of troubles. The metaphor, to take arms against sea of troubles is illogical and does, doesn't seem to make sense to people. But Irish and English people understand it without difficulty. It alludes to a Celtic myth, the custom of the warriors fighting waves with their swords drawn. Right? Mythology, right? Extend metaphor. Usually, a metaphor has one principal subject and one subsidiary, subsidiary subject. The extended one has one principal subject with several subsidiary comparisons. Lyndon B. Johnson, the president of the USA, in his inaugural address, pictured America as the uncrossed desert and unclimbed ridge, the star that is not reached, and the harvest that's sleeping in the unplowed ground. Uh, Jacob Altrey's metaphor. This is the metaphor I have observed and uh, given a name to in Yeats' poem like Beggar to Beggar. This is my definition of metaphor, right? Which has, has been analyzed about. The jack of all trades metaphor is one word that pictures multiple things. As in the sample poem, the word devil, right? Devil, we, we've gone through the poem, devil. <coughs> devil in my shoes, De devil, right? Uh, devil means uh, wanderlust hmm? and or sexual desire and the vanity of man and woman seeking the skin deep beauty in each of the individual lives. Uh, implied metaphor. Many of modern poets have this metaphor in the poetry. I discussed Wallace Stevens to explain this uh, below. New metaphors are defined by poets. Mythic metaphors implied. Now, let, uh, let me go to Yeats and Stevens and attempt a new definition of what the poetic metaphor is. When we talk about Yeats's prose, prose work, A Vision, we think of it as system, a mystical, metaphysical system. It seems to me that Yeats in here is not inter interested in the formulation of a system. He is searching for metaphors purportedly. Yeats knew well uh, uh, that a certain uh, uh, metaphors, which could, uh, for instance, satisfy the Elizabethan public, will no longer be moving to the public in our time. Compared with us, in the Elizabethan literature, the subjective self of a poet did not conceal itself. The poet is part of a society which is highly cultivated and educated, and the metaphors that, uh, benefits that he uses are part of knowledge, that of philosoph philosophy and literature and art. That is shared by all, as is elaborated in the book, The Elizabethan World Picture by Tilliard. That is to say, the Elizabethan public 
has a frame of reference and in whatever way uh, the metaphor could originate from the subjectivity of a poet ending up giving fuel to the pub uh, general public's imagination. Today, however, we, as well as GH, live in an age of science and everything is to be objectified and measured. Uh, literature is no exception. It has to be objective, producing writers such as T.S. Eliot and Bernard Shaw. Shaw is probably the opposite of GH. Uh, Bernard Shaw believes in science, that is, sociology and science and more, uh, Marx, Marx, Marx. Marxism, right, Marx. Yeats believes in mythology and philosophy, pseudo-philosophy and Dante. In the eyes of moderns and postmoderns, Yeats is a poet who has grown traveled as he grows old, making an unbelievable formulation as is seen in the book, A Vision. Edmund Wilson, uh, a scholar, a great scholar, in his Axel's Castle, his book, an excellent study in the imaginative literature of 1870 to 1930 wonders uh, what right Yeats has to bore us with it and what right he has to expect us to explore page after page of such stuff as the following description of the habits of the soul of death, referring to Yeats' vision. Half a century later, after show, Eliot and Yeats, it appears to be clearer now that poetry as well as other forms of literature is still viable despite the fact that science has developed in the fashion pace ever, and at the same time, we have realized the poetry is resourceful enough to be compatible with science, thanks to poets like Yeats. For a while, after Eliot and objective poet, poetry seems to have, be, have been running low, its feeling and emotion turning shallow and shallower. Then Wallace Stevens triumphs after Yeats, then contemporaneous with us, Irish poet Seamus Heaney proved strong, still in the spirit of mythology, tra mythology tradition. What has Yeats attempted in his book, A Vision? Was it aimed to formulate uh, formulate, formulate system of science? It did not seem to be. Why did he embark such a project in such a serious manner as if he were doing a scientific experiment? Because he wanted to create great poetry. Observations in statistics mean nothing. Works of art, which depend on them, can have no enduring value. <coughs> First of all, Yeats, as poet, was in a, a, a difficult age. As, as, as Edmund Wilson says, it may be true that the kind of dignity and distinction which have been characteristic of the poet in the past are becoming more and more impossible in our modern democratic society and during a period when the Ascendancy of science, scientific ideas, has made ma man conscious of his kinship with the other animals and of the subjugation to biographical and physical laws rather than of his relation to the gods. It was easy for the relic poet, from YSAs to Wallace, to express himself both directly and elegantly because he was a courtier, or in any case, a member of comparatively small educated class whose speech combined the candor and nationalness of conversation among equals with the grace of a courtly society. But the modern poet who would follow this tradition and who would yet deal with life in large way must create for himself a special personality, must maintain a state of mind which shall shut out to remain indifferent to many aspects of contemporary. As a, re as a result, Yeats was preoccupied with pseudo-philosophical meditation man and his civilization, leading to the writing of a beautiful prose work, A Vision, in which he wanted to create universal value system of reference for his poetic imagination or for his poetic metaphors. Many of his poems are the direct or indirect workings of the formulation developed in the book and proved to be superb. We cannot deny uh, that they look and sound true and are moving. Even when we read the book itself, we cannot say that the book is untrue. For if we deny that, we will have to deny what we are. Humanity is founded on mythology. It is important to see whether the tradition that's been established by H is one that could stand the test of time and which 
could help pave the road for poets who are ambitious and good for future humanity. I posit Wallace Stevens in the age tradition, no matter how different in temperament and the texture of poetry. Implied metaphor. Now, let me discuss a new approach, a metaphor without metaphor, which can be called implied metaphor. After Yeats, probably one of the most subjective poets in our time is Wallace Stevens. Like Yeats, he seeks truth in poetry for Stevens, poetry is religion. His poetry is created through meditation. To understand him, it would be helpful to read a poem of his, Metaphors of uh, uh, Magnifico, in which the reader could get a glimpse of how he creates a poem. The whole poem goes like this. Twenty men crossing a bridge into a vill village are twenty men crossing twenty villages into twenty villages, or one man crossing a single bridge into a village. This is all song that will not declare itself. Twenty men crossing a bridge into a village, or twenty men crossing a bridge into a village, that will not declare itself, yet is certain as meaning. The boots of the, uh, of the men clump on the boards of the bridge. The first white wall of the village rises through fruit, fruit trees of uh, what was it, I was thinking. So the meaning escaped. The first white wall of the village, the fruit trees. Uh, Milton J. Bates reads this poem as it is and uh, produces this poem as evidence of Stephen's definition and the product of sensibility. Bates misunderstands this poem and misinterprets what Yeats says about the process of creating a poem. Stevens makes a distinction between sensibility and imagination. Thus, yet if one, question, one questioned the dogma that the origin of poetry, the origins of poetry are to be found in the sensibility, and if one says that the 14th poem or uh, 14th painting is a synthesis of exceptional concentration, uh, that degree of concentration that has a lucidity of its own, in which we see clearly, clearly what we want to do and do it instantly and perfectly, we find that the operative force within us does not, in fact, seem to be the ins sensibility, that is to say, the feelings. It seems to be a constructive faculty that derives its energy more from the imagination than from the sensibility, the, r the relation between Portland and painting. As is often seen in Stephen's other poems, including uh, this is a poem of poetic process, or how a poem forms itself. Bates seems to have mi misinterpreted this portion, and this misunderstanding of his, of, of his results in his misunderstanding of poem. Stevens here definitely makes a distinction between sensibility and imagination, but Stevens does not say that the sensibility alone of a poet forms a poem. He even emphatically stresses the role of imagination as a constructive faculty, that is, the faculty that creates poem. Furthermore, this poem does not indicate that the mere rendering of an object or scene is imaginative failure, as Bates says. The poem is a kind of metaphor implied. Bates denies that th uh, there is a metaphor here. There is little of metaphor in the Magnifico's uh, perception, and it is a metaphor of the creative faculty of the mind. If you look for an individual metaphor, it is not there, but make the Magnifico into a poetic self. Then you have a picture of Im imagination being busy working on a poem. A poem is not, a e uh, not easy to write, and the good one is still harder to do, to do. The last line, the last two lines are two images stripped of the workings of the lines that precede them. Yet, we should not look for uh, meaning in this poem, but look at the structured poem being born uh, which is the very meaning of the poem. The imagination is fueled by the sense, the visual sense. Twenty men crossing a bridge into a village is a scene watched by the poet, Magnifico. The next two lines are the verb and the complement. Twenty men are twenty men. These same lines are separate questions. Are twenty men crossing? The stanza's last two lines is linked with a conjunction, or. This conjunction, or, performs a miraculous role. It is a question and a statement at the same time. 
that is, or is one man crossing a single bridge into a bridge, uh, village, or is it one man crossing a single bridge into a village? Back to the first two lines, these depict and represent the objective state of observation then. The following two lines represent the movement of the poetic self from objectivity to subjectivity. The poet, poetic self enters into each of the men marching into the village. To each of the 20, one village is the same as 20, for each has its own concept of the village. The last two lines uh, go further uh, to the objectified self-imagination. And the next stanza is, in fact, a couplet that belongs to the stanza that precedes it. It makes a comment on the stanza. The song will not declare itself, but it is old song, poem. The next stanza looks simple. It is a depiction of a, sen a, a scene of the 20 men marching into village. It is a clarity itself. But the next couplet implies that it is a certain as meaning, but that it is not a song, a poem. That is to say, the, the watcher is guessing a meaning of the marching soldiers. He's not comp composing poem here. He is guessing what is happening to the village and the 20 men. The last section shows the poetic self linking and searching for the images that would for form a poem. When the objective self turns his eye to the marchers, it wonders what it, is, uh, it was thinking. Then the meaning escapes. The poem is incomplete. The first, uh, the, the first white wall of the village, the fruit trees. Overall, this is a beautiful poeticizing of the poetic self going through a creative process. It is tight formal structure. It is, I think, one of Stevens' good points. One way of avoiding misinterpreting Stevens is to understand the fact that J.H. Uh, Stevens you know, often begins a poem with a sensation or sensibility or feelings. His, image is, his imagination is being simultaneously engaged, as is observed in many of his poems, as exemplified in Variations on a Summer Day. To change nature, not merely change ideas. To escape from the body, so to feel those feelings that the body balks. The feelings of nature round us here, as a boat feels when it cuts blue water. Beautiful, right? Metaphor of postmodern sensibility and conceit as ex ex exemplified in Seamus Heaney. Heaney is our contemporary and we feel closer to him than to Yeats. Yeats is a bit Shellian, while Heaney is not. Of course, we are well aware of the distinct difference between the romantic poet Shelley and the two modern poets. Compared with two other uh, modern poets, Yeats, uh, Shelley seems, seems to me and uh, to Herbert Grierson as well, to be a realist, but he was different realist than we. Today, under, uh, today we understand the term realist. As Grierson uh, says, he has no grasp of reality, no clear, definable consciousness of the contrast between what is and what he dreams of and desires, or as far as he, uh, he has it, can express it only in musical lament. Grierson's description of Shelley seems to roughly fit Yeats, but this same description, strangely, doesn't fit, doesn't seem to fit Heaney at all. Heaney is a traditionalist, like Yeats, but the difference is that Yeats lives more by faith than by reason, whereas Heaney seems to draw on reason rather than faith. Both poets are mythology. You, uh, both poets use mythology, but Yeats created his own system of faith, while uh, Heaney just subordinate the relevant truths to his frame of poetry. So, he needs a poet of reason, a poet of 20th century sensibility. His metaphor is as bold and precise as Yeats's, and sometimes bold enough to remind us of John Donne's conceit. Prior to going into his poetry for metaphors, I'd like to think what he is as poet. I introduced his critics, I introduced his critics himself as well in so doing. Edmund compares he and Yeats. He is more in Joyce's mode than in the line of Yeats, and praises Station Island, in which he finds the exfoliating and augmenting of Heaney's prodigious talent. In his poetry, some very prominent metaphor dances inside and outside of his poetic imagination. 
It is very deep rooted in the mind of poet with the rich background, which is both personal and historical or cultural. He talks about how, how a poem evolves in this case. I've always listened for poems. They come sometimes like bodies uh, come out of bog, almost complete, seeming to have been laid down a long time ago, surfacing with a touch of mystery. They certainly involve craft and determination, but chance and instinct uh, have a role in, in the thing, too. I think the process is a kind of uh, somnambulist encounter uh, between masculine will and intelligence and the feminine cluster of image and emotion. About this passage, uh, Kalenda Green in her essay, the feminine principle in Seamus Sinis Posse, which is an excellent piece that theorizes about the metaphor of a bog as central feminine principle beautifully as follows. As a young child, Heaney and the friends stripped naked and based in a mossy ball. The event was a seminal experience in uh, Heaney's life, so central that he still feels betrothed to Wortley ground. He, his descent into the ball became the abiding metaphor of his poetry. The female principle is in, in, inseparable from that metaphor, whether he is delving into the depths of earth, the bog, the womb, or the Celtic unconscious of the Irish people. Ultimately, the feminine principle is that which pulls man toward the sustaining earth and encourages participation in the domestic and religious rituals, which gives life to life continuity. Such a bog metaphor is exemplified in poem, poems including digging, my grandfather cut more tough in a day than any other man on Tornos Bog. Once I carried him milk in a bottle, corked sloppily with paper. He straightened up to drink it, then fell to right away, uh, nicking and slicing neatly, heaving south over his shoulder, going down and down for the good tough, digging. The cold smell of potato mold, uh, the squelch and slap of soggy peat, the curt cuts of an ash through living roots awaken in my head, but I, but I have no spade to follow men like, like them, Bogland. Uh, Bogland, yeah? They'll never dig or hear the coal here, only the water log trunks of uh, great firs, uh, soft as pulp, our uh, prisons keep striking inward and downward. Every layer they strip seems, uh, seems camped on before. The uh, bog holes might be Atlantic uh, sheepish. The wet center is bottleness, punishment. The certain critic finds in Heaney a postmodern poet. I dealt with the postmodern elements in Yeats in my essay, The Poetics of Postmodernism and concluded that those elements have really existed in the poetry of modernism. The postmodern move in the foreground as time moves on. Uh, Heaney is not a modernist and belongs to our postmodernist period. So I believe that it is quite natural that we sometimes find him postmodernistic. I do find with Bernardo Donahue that some of Heaney's poems, including Serenade and Snambulist, and vision are uh, postmodern poem. It is interesting to see in Heaney, animals turning up in his alter ego or his wife. Vision is that key to Paul Muldoon. Vision, what is vision? Animal, right, a duck, duck vision. Right? And uh, Paul Muldoon is a younger poet. Okay, he is a professor at Princeton University. And uh, he dedicated this poem to him, vision. Page 28, a vision. It had been barely shot. It had been badly shot. While he was plucking it, he found, he says, the voice box, like a flute stopped in the broken windpipe and blew upon it unexpectedly his own small vision cries. The metaphor sounds postmodernistic. The bird had been badly shot and must be still alive while being cooked, the sound that the bird's broken windpipe makes is unexpectedly like his own recent cry. 
The T is no doubt Paul Molden, Muldoon, whose for, for postmodern sensibility keeps partly alive because it is uh, malleable to the current age of science. Unexpectedly, he is able to keep singing. The kind of metaphor he uses was not possible in the Elizabethan poetry, for instance, because the poet never identified himself with animals. He was below angels and was above animals. Yet, Heaney never feels uneasy about being assimilated with an animal, skunk, in, as in the skunk. Skunk? Do you like skunk? Heaney compares his wife to skunk, right? <laughs> so, as in, as the animals in Yeshi, the circus animals' desertion bespeak the old theme that he had loved to ponder, the skunk turns into a calmly, lovely wife without any bad feeling toward bad feeling toward the animal. It is as bold as John Donne, but the sensibility that counts the skunk among, among us humans is possibly only with the advance of science, which both confirm the bestial and celestial nature that coexists in humanity. Here is how the metaphor works, works a miracle. I'll skip uh, reading the poem, we read it. The role of metaphor, skunk, is multiple. Sometimes it is an image that reminds him of his wife looking for the black plant line night rash. Sometimes it is a catalyst, a smelly animal, but strengthens the taste and fragrance of wine. By this time, the speaker identifies the skunk with his woman. There she was, the intent and glamorous, ordinary, mysterious skunk, mythologized, demythologized snuffing the boards five feet be uh, beyond me. Actually, uh, the poem was written in California, missing his wife, right? He is alone in California. We, as we have seen above, as in Heaney, as well as in uh, Yeats and Stevens, the metaphor is not a dead rhetoric, nor a floral ornament. It changes as time changes. It becomes subtle and complex <coughs> as the age progresses. In fact, it is inexhaustible, as malleable and adaptable as man is. The metaphor is enriched when imagination grows. It is with no bounds, for imagination knows no bound. Uh, okay, uh, the final section. Now, it's time to finish up a new constructive Im imagination metaphor and the relation of the two. As is seen in college, it may be useful to make a distinction between fancy and imagination. But if it is applied to a whole work, namely that the detective novel is a form of fancy, is defined by Richard, it causes a lot of trouble. So if we talk about literary work, we can say how immensive it is, how good it is. It is, uh, it is, is almost the same as how immensive it is, um, how much fire of imagination it does strike in the mind of the reader. The metaphor imagination are indispensable to each other. Imagination with a metaphor will struggle. For metaphor can help strike the fire imagination with most economy. Good metaphors help con contribute to the richness and profundity of imaginativeness of a poem ex exemplified in Shakespeare. Yeats, Cheney, Stevens, and others. In particular, Yeats, in spite of himself, develops new concept metaphor that this metaphoric writing is perfected by the presence of a symbolic. Uh, Stevens also metaphorizes his poetry without metaphors, which is to tell us that poetry is incomplete or imperfect without metaphors. Metaphor has developed in a new direction. Yeats developed new system of reference in defiance to the advance of drier and shallower inference of science, that is, man is nothing but an animal, says science, but Yeats's vision says the other way around, that is, man is part of the universal law. His poetry grows richer by the metaphors elaborated in, in the book, A Vision. Heaney also goes to mythology to, to get his poetry enriched. Unlike Yeats, who created his own version, ver, version of mythology, he returns to the universal myth available in Ireland and Europe. The result is both very powerful for regional power of the metaphors that originate from mythology, which is the inherent nature of humanity, a system of knowledge with which all men are born. 
Besides the mythic metaphors, both poets are the master of metaphors in a way different from Shakespeare. The Shakespeare metaphor is, on the other hand, romantic and in general direct, whereas to point out the difference, the ancient or Hinian metaphor is postmodern and direct, or on the other. The ancient Hini, of course, show many traits of romantic tradition, both being poets of strong romantic strain. In closing, I'd like to define the relation of imagination to metaphor by drawing on Shakespeare. The definition of love between the phoenix and turtle is identical to that of the relation between imagination and metaphor in poetry. So between them, love did shine. That turtle saw his ride flaming in the ph uh, phoenix's sight. Either was the other's mind. Pro property was so, thus appalled that the self is not the same. Single nature's double name, neither to nor one was called. Okay, I will take 10 minutes break.